Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing embryonic and induced pluripotent stem cells. Okay, so in the previous video what we did is we introduced the topic by uh, looking first at what embryonic stem cells are, okay, and basically they are these cultured inner cell mass cells, okay, that remain pluripotent and which can proliferate indefinitely, okay. Now, we also talked about the differentiation or specialization process, which is the process by which one of these inner cell mass cells can specialize to become one of the specialized cells of the body. Okay, for instance, a hepatocyte and a neuron. Okay, and now what we want to discuss is what actually underlies that process. Okay, why are these two cells so different? Okay, so originally, the thoughts underlying this were that it involved progressive loss of genes, okay, i.e. a change to the genome. So, the original theory was that the zygote here, the first ever cell, would contain absolutely all of the genes, okay, of that person. Okay, then as they gradually progressed through this, so for instance, as you differentiate firstly into trophoblast cells or inner cell mass cells, what would happen is the reason that was occurring is that loads of genes have been deleted from both of them. So the um, embryoblasts, the inner cell mass cells, would have lost the genes associated with trophoblast phenotype, and the trophoblast phenotype would have lost the genes um, associated with the embryoblast phenotype. Okay, and then the idea was that as you continue on towards specialized cells, you just lose more and more genes until when you get to these specialized cells here, they've lost a huge number of genes and they only have the genes that they actually need to express. And that that was what underlies the change uh, that is differentiation, basically. And that the reason these two cells are so different is that they're effectively genetically hugely different. Their genomes are completely different. Okay, now, why was it thought to be that extreme? Well, the key thing that made people think that it was that extreme was that uh, differentiation, this specialization process, seems to be irreversible. Okay, it didn't seem to be uh, that you could take a specialized cell, such as a hepatocyte, and turn it back into uh, an inner cell mass cell. Okay, so if we had had a loss of genes, then that would explain perfectly why the process was irreversible. Okay, however, we now know that this theory that you have a change to the genome, and the genome just means all of the genes in the cell, okay, uh, that this is wrong, basically, okay, and we've known this for a long time, and we've known this because of a very famous experiment that I'd just like to talk you through, okay, by John Gurdon, okay, so this is an extremely famous experiment that was done by John Gurdon, and uh, the experiment is called somatic cell nuclear transfer, and what this experiment proved is that all somatic cells in the body, okay, so all specialized cells retain the original genome, basically. They have the same genome as the original zygote that made the whole human, basically. Okay, so this was an experiment that proved that uh, you didn't have this progressive loss of genes underlying the specialization process. Okay, and somatic cell nuclear transfer is often abbreviated down to SCNT. So let me describe to you what John Gurdon originally did in this somatic cell nuclear transfer experiment. Okay, so basically he was working with frogs. I'll go over onto the other page. Okay, uh, and what he did is he took an egg cell of a frog. Okay, so here is an unfertilized egg cell of a frog. So this is unfertilized egg cell, so I'll just put egg cell here, okay, and what he did is he enucleated it, so he removed the nucleus of this egg cell here, so enucleation occurred, okay, and then what you've got is the egg cell now with no nucleus, okay, and then what he did is he went to a somatic cell, okay, so a specialized cell, okay, which he took actually from a tadpole rather than an adult frog, Okay, so he took a specialized cell, which was specifically an intestinal cell, from a tadpole. Okay, so here is an intestinal cell. 
okay, and he took the nucleus from the intestinal cell and he transferred it into the enucleated egg cell. Okay, so now here is the nucleus from this specialized intestinal cell now in our egg cell. Okay, and basically, if you leave this, um, e this now uh, egg cell with a nucleus in it, some of these will actually develop into tadpoles and into perfectly uh, viable frogs. Okay, so this develops basically. And what you then produce is a clone of the original tadpole, basically. Okay, how do you spell develops? Is it just like that? I, I kind of feel like there should be an E there. I think there is an E there. Develops. Hmm. Um, right. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. So, basically, the principle of this experiment is that you can take the nucleus from one of these completely differentiated cells and stick it into an enucleated egg cell, and it works. Okay, now why does that disprove the concept that in order to specialize, you have to lose genes? Well, if it was the case that uh, this specialized cell had a nucleus that had lost genes, okay, then if we put it back into a egg cell like this, then that would not be viable anymore because it would be missing loads of genes that you would need to make other types of cells. Okay, the fact that this can make a whole frog means that that nucleus that we put in must have had the entire genome in. Okay, so this was a, the first proof that somatic cells uh, did not lose genes, basically, that they had the full genome still intact. Okay, right. Now, uh, we have not since done this in mammals, okay? Not just frogs anymore, this has been done in mammals, okay? So very famously, we did this exact same experiment in sheep, basically, okay? And we created the first cloned sheep, uh, one of the most famous animals in the world. Dolly the sheep, basically, was created. And she was created in the same way. Basically, you went to an adult sheep, took a specialized cell, and I don't know the exact cell that was taken for Dolly, okay? You took the nucleus from that somatic cell, and you put it into an enucleated egg cell from a sheep, okay? And then you took that cell, that egg cell with the nucleus now in, and note this nucleus uh, is deployed, okay? Whereas the original nucleus of the uh, egg cell was only haploid. Okay, so this is effectively like a fertilized egg cell now. And then if you put that into uh, a, a female uh, surrogate mother, uh, then it will develop into a sheep in some cases. Okay, the success rate isn't 100%, uh, but in some cases it will develop into an uh, adult sheep. And that was Dolly the sheep. Dolly the sheep was the first cloned mammal. Okay, right. Uh, she's dead now. Um, she died in 2003, and I believe um, she has been stuffed and preserved. Okay, but she proved a very important point, uh, which was that cloning is possible, and also that in mammals, like in amphibians, uh, all um, specialized cells retain the full genome. They must do, otherwise you wouldn't be able to uh, produce a sheep from a... Uh, enucleated egg cell with a somatic cell nucleus put into it. Okay, right. Uh, so, now we are in the era of genomics, so we don't need these fancy little experiments to prove this anymore. Okay, we can just do this by brute force. Oh, okay, so we can just take somatic specialized cells and um, sequence their genomes and show that the genome of all of these different specialized cells is the same, basically. And hence, uh, we can prove in this rather more boring way uh, that the genome of specialized cells has not been changed in order to drive the specialization process. Okay, so basically, the change is not to the genome. All specialized cells of the body retain the full genome. There is one horrible little exception to that rule, okay, which is, uh, well, in fact, there's more than one exception to the rule. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus at all. They're the simple exception to the rule, okay. But the other exception to the rule, which is nastier, is uh, in lymphocytes, where you can get somatic uh, changes to the genome in order for them to have uh, different 
T-cell receptors and different B-cell receptors, okay? But we won't go there. Those are little exceptions in the hematopoietic system. Most specialised cells in the body retain the full genome, and the reason that underlies their uh, specialisation is not changes in the genome, basically. Okay, so what is it? If we haven't got changes in the genome, then what does underlie the specialization process? Why is a neuron so different from a hepatocyte? Well, basically, it's not genetics. The answer doesn't lie in genetics. Instead, it lies in epigenetics. So what is epigenetics? Okay, so epigenetics is all about which genes actually get made into protein. Okay, so genetics is all about which genes do you have in your genome. Epigenetics is about which genes are you actually using. Okay, because remember the whole point of genes is that they can be transcribed into RNA. The RNA can then be translated into protein. Okay, so uh, epigenetics is all about what controls which genes actually get turned into protein. Okay, right. Uh, so, basically, to cut a long story short, the changes that are observed, the differences between uh, two different specialised cell types, neurons and hepatocytes, is that they have different epigenetics, okay? They have the same genome, but they are expressing different parts of it, and that's why they have such different phenotypes. Okay, right. Uh, so, let me tell you a little bit more about epigenetics, then. Okay, so, firstly a few numbers. In the human genome, there are around 21,000 protein coding genes. Okay, so these are genes which will be transcribed into RNA, and the RNA will then be translated into protein. Okay, so you have 21,000 protein coding genes. It's also important to note that some of the genes uh, that you have in the human genome are not protein coding genes, but are still classed as genes. Okay, so there are, ex um, there are estimated to be 9,000 uh, non-coding RNA genes. Okay, so basically these are genes which will be transcribed into RNA. Okay, but the RNA is then not translated. The RNA itself is the final product of the gene in this case. Okay, um, so the point of transcription is not to produce the protein, but to produce the RNA. The RNA is the final product. Okay, so examples, of course, uh, are um, the RNA molecules which are involved in creating ribosomes. Okay, so they're important in producing the functional unit of the ribosome. Okay, right. So, basically, the idea is that of these 30,000 genes, if you go to different specialised cell types, the expression levels of these genes will vary between different specialised cell types. So, to draw a picture for this, just to get the concept across, what we could do is we could go through all 30,000 genes. Okay, so we could have a little part for gene 1 here, a little part for gene 2 here, a little part for gene 3 here, a little part for gene 4, and then we could go on all the way up to 30,000. And what we could do is ask, what is the expression level of each one of these genes? Okay, now for the protein coding genes, we might like to ask, how much actual protein do you have? Okay, for the RNA genes, where the product is the RNA, then we'd want to ask, how much RNA do you have? Okay, and basically we could put little graphs for each type of cell. So we could start, say, with a hepatocyte, and we might find that its expression level of gene 1 is like this, its expression of gene 2 is like this, its expression of gene 3 is like this, its expression of gene 4 is like that. Okay, and then if we went to a different specialised cell, let's say a neuron, what we might find is if we made a similar graph, it would be very different. So maybe in neurons, uh, the lines would look like this, so I'll do them in red. So gene 1 might be much lower expressed in neurons. Okay, gene 2 might be higher expressed in neurons. Gene 3 might be the same expression in neurons. Gene 4 might be a slightly lower expression in neurons. Okay, so the point is that if we were to make one of these expression profiles like so, the different specialised types of cell would have a different expression profile. Okay, now, 
Uh, to give some nice, easy to understand examples of this, there are certain proteins that have very extreme expression profiles, i.e. they are not expressed at all in most cells, and then suddenly in one specialised type of cell, they're suddenly expressed. Okay, So, uh, the sort of prototypical example of this is haemoglobin, okay? the proteins which make up haemoglobin. Okay, so the different subunits that make up haemoglobin are only expressed, basically, in red blood cells. They're not expressed in other uh, cell types other than red blood cells. So if we went along to the genes that code for the subunits of haemoglobin, uh, then in most cells you would have zero expression in all of them. Okay, and then suddenly if you went to red blood cells, you'd have a massive great expression of them. Okay, so those are some very extreme examples of epigenetic changes. Uh, between specialised cell types. Okay, and of course the haemoglobin will be made in red blood cell precursors before they have lost their nuclei. Okay, another uh, nice example of a very extreme uh, expression profile for a protein uh, is an enzyme called tyrosine aminotransferase. Okay, so there's an enzyme called tyrosine aminotransferase. Uh, which is often abbreviated down to TAT for short, TAT, okay? Um, and basically, this enzyme is involved in breaking down uh, tyrosine uh, that you consume in food, okay? And pretty much this enzyme is only expressed in the liver cells, okay? So you'd find it expressed at a high level in hepatocytes, but then if you went to all the other specialised cell types of the body, you wouldn't find it expressed at all. Okay, so that's another um, nice extreme example of epigenetics. Okay, however, generally the epigenetic changes between different specialised cell types are much less extreme than these two examples. These are the really easy to understand ones, where you have a few genes that are only expressed in a certain specialised cell type, but most genes, the changes between different cell types uh, in their expression levels uh, are much more subtle, basically. Okay, so, even in certain proteins that are utterly essential for the cell's function, you do find variation in the expression level in different specialised cell types. So let me just outline some of these examples here. So, for instance, uh, cytoskeletal proteins, the proteins which make the components of the cytoskeleton, those are utterly essential for all cell types to have, generally. Okay? Um, but their expression level does vary in different cells, okay? So different specialised cell types will have different expression, even of this essential protein, okay? So the point here is that even the essential proteins that are expressed in all cells, their levels vary in different specialised cell types, okay? So to give some more examples of essential proteins that you need expressed in all cell types, uh, also the enzymes that catalyse the key metabolic reactions, okay? So for instance, the reactions of respiration, those key reactions for life that all cells are going to have to participate in, okay, the expression levels of those enzymes varies between different specialised cell types, okay, it's subtly, okay, there's not going to be anything as extreme as, for instance, the haemoglobin subunits, because obviously if you don't express them at all, then you're dead, uh, but um, they will subtly vary between different specialised cell types. Okay. In addition, I'll just add a few more onto here. Okay. So the DNA repair enzymes, those are expressed in all cell types, but to different levels in different cell types. Okay. So they'll be expressed presumably at higher levels in cells that you would expect to uh, have more DNA uh, damage occurring in, so potentially the cells of the skin. Okay. Uh, in addition, uh, the proteins that make ribosomes and also the RNAs that make ribosomes, those are essential for all cells, but again, the expression level of them varies between different specialised cell types. So the point here that is that the reason that specialised cell types are different is not that the genome is different, instead it's that they are epigenetically different. It's the fact that the 
genes that are actually being expressed in different cell types vary. So if you look at one cell type and compare it to another cell type, and you look at every single one of the 30,000 30, genes that each of these cells have, and you look at what the expression level is, basically often it will vary for every single one of them. Oh, these there. Um, expression profile of different genes varies basically and that's what creates the difference between uh, these different cell types okay that's what is responsible for specialization okay right uh, so just before i talk a little bit more about how uh, epigenetics can vary even in differentiated cell types i would just like to introduce you to some useful pieces of terminology okay so these are genome transcriptome and proteome, the ohms. Okay, so genome, transcriptome, and proteome. So what do these all mean? Okay, so basically we know what the genome means. The genome means the collection of all genes that a cell has. Okay, the transcriptome means the collection of all mRNAs that a cell has. Okay, so a cell has its genome and then it's going to transcribe certain genes within its genome to produce RNA, okay? And that collection of all the RNA in a cell, that is what is meant by the transcriptome of the cell, okay? So if I draw a little picture of this, if we have our cell here, the genome is all the genes of the cell, okay, like so. And we're saying that the genome of all cells in the body, all the specialized cells, is the same, okay? The transcriptome is then all the RNAs that the cell has, and that's not going to be the same between different specialized cell types, okay? So the genome is the same, but the transcriptome varies, and even more so, after the transcriptome, we then have the proteome, which is all of the proteins of the cell. So if you look at this cell, it will have loads of different proteins expressed. All of those proteins, that's what's meant by the proteome of the cell. Okay, and again, that will vary hugely between the different cell types. Okay, so basically the idea here is that between different specialized cell types, the genome remains constant, but the transcriptome and the proteomes hugely vary, and that's what's responsible for the hugely different phenotypes of these specialized cells. Okay, right. Now, what I just want to talk about before we just uh, move on to looking at epigenetics and how uh, gene expression is controlled, what I want to mention is the fact that even in differentiated cell types, you can temporarily change um, which genes are expressed. You can make little changes, little transient changes to the gene expression profiles within cells. Okay, so the example that I'm going to give you is uh, glucocorticoids and the effect that those can have on many different cells of the body. Okay, and this will also illustrate another important point, which is that um, these hormones, in the case of glucocorticoids, which can change gene expression in cells, the way that they change gene expression is actually going to be different in different cell types. Okay, and this is going to become an important point later on when we've discussed epigenetics and when we're on to what controls um, the epigenetics within a cell. Okay, right, so let me just tell you a little bit about glucocorticoids. Right, so glucocorticoids, the principal example of a glucocorticoid is the hormone cortisol in humans, okay? And this is secreted by a layer of the adrenal glands, okay, in response uh, to uh, stress, basically. So, for instance, in situations where you're under starvation, under conditions of starvation, that would... Um, be an example of a stressful situation, or in periods of intense exercise, that would be another example of a stressful situation, okay? And the cortisol is going to alter gene expression to help with uh, glucose homeostasis in the body, okay? So let me just draw the adrenal glands first so that we can uh, see which layer of the adrenal glands is going to release the cortisol. Okay, right, so adrenal glands look like this, okay? They sit atop the kidneys, okay? And they are, can be divided into two different portions. There is the central portion of the adrenal gland here, which is known as the adrenal medulla, okay? Which I'll color in 
in red here, and that's the portion that releases adrenaline into the blood in fight or flight situations. The kind of stress that we're undergoing at the moment isn't the, that same sort of stress as uh, would cause the release of adrenaline. Okay, adrenaline is released in life or death situations. Cortisol, uh, the main glucocorticoid of humans, is released more under sort of um, long, enduring, physical uh, stress to the body, rather than a life and death situation. Okay, right. Uh, this is more sort of a rapidly stressful situation, whereas cortisol is a more sort of long-term, chronic, stressful situation. Okay, so, uh, we have three different layers of the adrenal cortex, which I'm now going to colour in in different colours. So there's the innermost layer of the adrenal cortex in green there. Then the next layer of the adrenal cortex, I'm colouring in in orange. And then the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex, I'll colour in in blue here. Okay, and it's the middle layer of the adrenal cortex that is important in releasing cortisol. Okay, so let me just give you the names of these different layers. So in blue here, the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex is known as the zona glomerulosa. And it's important in releasing the uh, hormone aldosterone, which is important in body fluid volume control. Okay, the middle layer of the adrenal cortex is what's known as zona fasciculata. Okay, fasciculata. Okay, and it's this layer that's going to be important in releasing uh, glucocorticoids, principally cortisol, into the blood. Okay, in times of stress. Okay, and then the innermost layer of the adrenal cortex is what's known as zona reticularis, and it's this layer that's important in secreting sex steroids, basically, uh, such as androgens into the blood. Okay, right. So, zona fasciculata, this middle layer of the adrenal cortex, is going to release cortisol into the blood in times of stress. Okay, so for instance, starvation or intense exercise. And basically, this cortisol is going to alter um, gene expression in certain specialised cell types in the body, but it's going to alter gene expression in these different specialised cell types in hugely different ways, basically. And this is going to become an important concept that we can explain later on. Okay, right, once we've seen what actually controls um, the difference in epigenetics of these uh, different specialised cell types. Okay, right, uh, so uh, the zona fasciculata is then going to release the cortisol into the blood. And what's the point of the cortisol? What's it going to do? Well, the point of it is that it's going to alter blood glucose homeostasis. And let me explain why you need to alter blood glucose homeostasis in these stressful situations that I have described. So let me tell you about how normal blood glucose homeostasis works. So normally what happens is we have the liver here. That's incredibly important in normal blood glucose homeostasis. Okay, and we're talking about blood glucose homeostasis in the fasted state. So you haven't just eaten. Okay, so we can ignore the intestine. Okay, so what do we need to think about? Well, here let's have the blood. And the components of blood glucose homeostasis are twofold. One, you have the peripheral tissues, which will be removing glucose from the blood oops, and uh, using it for respiration. Okay, and we'll um, use as an example of a peripheral tissue the brain, principally. Okay, so peripheral tissues will be removing glucose from the blood and using it for their purposes. Okay, now, um, how do we maintain an equilibrium? How do we keep blood glucose concentration in this fasted state constant? We're saying we're in the fasted state, so we haven't just eaten, so there's no glucose coming in from the intestine. Okay, so if we're going to keep an equilibrium here, we need to put into the blood the same amount of glucose as the peripheral tissues are taking out. And this is usually done by the liver. The liver usually puts into the blood the same amount of um, glucose as the peripheral tissues are taking out. Now, where does the liver get this glucose from? Well, principally, 
in a normal unstressed state, okay, so where you haven't just been starved and when you haven't just done intense exercise, in the normal unstressed state, the liver will have lots of glycogen reserves, okay, so it will have glycogen stored in its cells, and basically the way that it gets the glucose that it's going to put into the blood is by breaking down the glycogen in a process called glycogenolysis, okay. Now, there is also another way that the liver can make glucose, but in the normal state, this is second to glycogenolysis. Okay, so the other process by which the liver can make uh, glucose in order to put it into the blood is by gluconeogenesis. Okay, now gluconeogenesis refers to the conversion of amino acids into glucose. So amino acids, the components of proteins, can be converted into glucose molecules by this process of gluconeogenesis. Okay, now usually when the liver has got a healthy glycogen reserve uh, in it, then this will sort of be a background process that isn't really that important. However, if you've been in one of these stressful situations where you are now starved or uh, you have just done intense exercise, then the glycogen reserves that are stored in the liver will have run out, basically. Okay, so now, that if the liver's going to maintain uh, being able to tip the same amount of glucose into the blood, it's going to have to upregulate gluconeogenesis. Now, the liver isn't very clever. It can't work out that it needs to do this itself. So basically, this is what the cortisol is going to come and do. The cortisol is going to now tell the liver cells that that they need to upregulate gluconeogenesis because glycogen is going to be running out. Okay, right. So what's going to happen is cortisol is going to change gene expression within the hepatocytes. And I think I'll draw a little hepatocyte here. So here is an example of a hepatocyte. Okay, the cortisol is going to change the gene expression within the hepatocytes to uh, increase the expression of uh, gluconeogenic enzymes. Okay, uh, in order that gluconeogenesis can be upregulated and therefore you can maintain this production of glucose that's going into the blood. Okay, right. So that's an example of how uh, these hormones, this blood hormone, cortisol, steroid hormone, uh, can alter gene expression within cells, okay, temporarily, okay. As soon as the cortisol is gone, the gene expression will revert back to what it was before. But you can basically alter gene expression, you can alter the epigenetics, you can create this little flux in the epigenetics even within this specialised cell type. So it's not the case that, you know, once you're a specialised cell type, your epigenetics is completely set, okay, your transcriptome is completely set, your proteome is completely set that it can still vary. These hepatocytes will alter their expression of the enzymes involved in gluconeogenesis, this conversion of amino acids into glucose, okay, in response to this peripheral hormone. Okay, so that's an important point. Now, to finish this story off, the other important point that I wanted to illustrate with this is that you, this same hormone, cortisol, can cause changes in gene expression in other tissues of the body and those changes in gene expression in other portions of the body can be extremely different from what it produces in the hepatocytes. Okay, so different specialised cell types can change gene expression in response to the same hormone in different ways. So let me complete the story. Okay, so another key tissue that uh, cortisol acts on is the skeletal muscle. Okay, so let me draw a picture of skeletal muscle here. Okay, so here is the belly of the muscle, here is the tendon here, and here's another tendon here. Okay, right, so this is our skeletal muscle here. Okay, now, basically cortisol can go into skeletal muscle cells, and it can alter gene expression in those cells as well. Okay, but this time it isn't going to upregulate enzymes for gluconeogenesis. No, in these different specialised cell types, what cortisol is actually going to do is increase the enzymes that are involved in proteolysis. Okay, so now what's going to happen is proteolysis is going to go up. Now, what does proteolysis mean? Basically, it refers to the breakdown of proteins 
into amino acids. Okay, now skeletal muscle cells are absolutely full of proteins. They're full of the actin and myosin filaments that are involved in contracting the skeletal muscle cell. Okay, so it's those proteins that you're going to start breaking down. You're going to break down the actin and the myosin uh, filaments. Okay, when you upregulate the enzymes involved in that proteolysis process. And then the point of this is that you can now tip those amino acids into the blood and those amino acids can go to the liver and they can supply the liver with the amino acids that it needs to convert those amino acids into uh, glucose basically. So for the gluconeogenesis process you need amino acids and those amino acids are going to be supplied uh, by the skeletal muscle taking part in this proteolysis pathway. Okay, right, so the key point that I was hoping to get across with that is that this hormone can alter gene expression transiently in differentiated cells and also it will alter gene expression differently in different differentiated cells and we will understand why that occurs uh, later on once we understand what it is that actually controls the epigenetics within a specialised cell type. Okay, right. So now what we want to turn our attention to is an in-detail discussion of epigenetics, okay, because this is so important for understanding uh, what it is that controls uh, the specialization of a cell. Okay, right. Uh, so firstly, I'm going to start off with a broad overview of the topic. Okay, and then we're going to focus in on a specific portion of it, the most important portion of it, because basically epigenetics is a hugely complicated uh, topic. It has a huge number of different levels of the at the central dogma of biology at which it can operate. Okay, and we're going to focus on the main one, which is transcriptional control. Okay, mainly because the things which actually control. Um, the specialization of a cell type, the master transcription regulators that control the specialization of a cell type are controlling transcription rather than the later stages of the central dogma. Okay, so let me just go over then basically uh, the central dogma of biology. Okay, and then we'll be in a position to say, well, which uh, points of this central dogma can uh, epigenetics play a role in controlling? Okay, so the central dogma of biology. So basically we start off with our gene here. So I'll draw two parallel lines here to represent a double-stranded piece of DNA. Okay, and we'll colour them in in blue here. So this is some gene here. Okay, and basically the first thing which happens is if you want this gene to actually be expressed to produce a protein, and we'll talk about a protein coding gene rather than a non-coding RNA gene, okay? Um, so if you want this gene to actually be expressed and to produce a protein, what you need to do is you need to produce a piece of mRNA that is complementary to the coding strand. So one of the strands of this gene will be the coding strand, and the other will be the non-coding strand. And it's the coding strand that is actually going to be read uh, by the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme to produce a piece of mRNA. The non-coding strand won't be read. Okay, so let's say this top one is the coding strand. So we're now going to read this coding strand and we're going to produce a piece of RNA that's complementary to this. Okay, now, this first piece of RNA that we produce that is exactly complementary to the coding strand is not ready to be translated yet. It's what's known as a pre-mRNA. Before it can be actually translated, certain processing processes have to occur, basically. Okay, and there are many of these processing steps, uh, three in total. Okay, so let me firstly describe the most important one, which is the process of splicing. Okay, so one of the key reasons that this pre-mRNA is not ready to be translated yet is that there are portions uh, of this pre-mRNA that are not actually supposed to be translated. So let me box these portions. In fact, let me box the portions that are supposed to be translated. So let's say this portion here, this portion here, and this portion here. Let's say those are the portions of the pre-mRNA that we actually want to translate, i.e. we actually want to read the codons in these regions and put together uh, a sequence of amino acids from that. The portions in between, we don't want to read those. Those need to be removed. Okay, now the portions that you actually do want to read here, that I've now got in a box here, 
These are what are known as the exons of the pre-mRNA. Okay, and then those portions in between the exons, all of these four portions, these are what are known as the introns. Okay, and these are the portions that you don't want to read. Okay, so the first process, or one of the processing processes that occurs to the pre-mRNA is the removal of the introns and the joining together of the exons, which are these now orange boxed portions. Okay, so what's going to occur is a process called splicing. Okay, and in splicing, basically what you do is you cut out the exons sew them back together, and then throw away the introns, okay? And this produces you a short piece of RNA here, which will only now contain the exons. Okay, so that's the process of splicing. Another key processing uh, process that occurs uh, to the RNA is that it also needs to have two structures put on it at its front and at its back. Okay, so RNA has a polarity. There is a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end, as of course there is for any nucleic acid strand. So we'll say this is the 5' prime end and this is the 3' prime end. Again, we'll say that's the 5' prime end of this one and this is the 3' prime end of this one. Okay, right. Now, basically, you're going to add a structure onto the 5' prime end of this RNA, and you're also going to add something onto the 3' prime end of this RNA. Okay, so onto the 5' prime end, you're going to add a tiny little structure known as the 5' prime cap. Okay, so this is the 5' prime cap, which is basically a nucleotide that's been altered slightly, that is now uh, put in the opposite direction to the way it should be. Okay, so you put on a little 5' prime cap here in red. Okay, and then on the 3' prime end, you put what's known as the polyadenosine tail. So you put loads and loads of adenine organic bases on and on and on and on to create what's called the polyadenosine tail. Okay, and these will all be in the correct orientation. Okay, so this is the poly A tail or the poly. I'll extend that to a denosine tail. Okay, so just adenine after adenine after adenine after adenine there. Okay, and now once you've done those three processing processes, the splicing, the addition of the cap, and the production of the polyadenosine tail, then what we have now here is what's called the mature mRNA. Okay, so all of these processes together are known as the RNA processing processes. Okay, so this is processing of the RNA. Okay, now what has to happen is, if you want this mature mRNA to actually be turned into a protein, a polypeptide, it needs to be exported from the nucleus. Okay, so if I draw a little picture for this. Next, what has to happen is it has to be exported from the nucleus. Okay, so we'll call that nuclear exportation because after all all of the ribosomes that are used to uh, translate the RNA those are not in the nucleus those are in the cytoplasm okay so then it will go to a ribosome in the cytoplasm and the ribosome will start at some point it'll find the start codon in this orange portion here and it will work its way along uh, and add in uh, the appropriate amino acids for the sequence of codons that you have in that mRNA and you'll produce the protein. Okay, so to put this in order, this first process here, where we produced the um, RNA, this is known as the process of transcription. Okay, then we had the processing process, then we had nuclear exportation, and then finally what we'll have in the cytoplasm is translation, where the ribosome will work its way along the mature mRNA in the cytoplasm and synthesize a polypeptide. Okay, so those are the four parts of the central dogma of biology. Okay, right, so now what we want to look at is where can epigenetic control occur? Okay, right, so there are loads of different points along this process where you can exert epigenetic control and stop uh, genes from actually being expressed as proteins. Okay, so remember, epigenetics is all about controlling your transcriptome and controlling your proteome. Okay, uh, that's what it's all about. It's not about controlling the genome. Okay, that's genetics. Epigenetics is all about controlling the transcriptome and the proteome. Okay, right. 
So, where can you exert control over this process? Well, basically anywhere you like. Okay, so there are examples of where you can control transcription of genes, and in fact, this is the most important one. If you're going to learn one form of epigenetic control, it's transcriptional control. Okay, so you can control which genes are actually transcribed in the first place. This is the key place that epigenetics controls the expression of genes. Okay, and this is the one that we are going to study in more detail. Okay, we're not going to mention any of the others that I'm about to mention in particular detail. Okay, so transcriptional control is the key one. Controlling which genes are actually transcribed into um, mRNA. Okay. However, there are other forms of epigenetic control um, which exert control later on in this central dogma pathway. Okay, so for instance, there are controls which control which pre-mRNAs are actually going to be processed. Okay, so there are ways of deciding which pre-mRNAs are actually going to be processed to mature mRNAs. So processing control is another way of controlling which genes are actually going to be expressed. Okay, I've missed out an S there, never mind. Processing control, I'll just add that in. Processing control. Okay, so I'll underline all of these uh, different forms of epigenetic control. So here's processing control, here's transcriptional control. Okay, moving on, you can also have control over which proteins are going to actually, sorry, which mature mRNAs are actually going to be exported from the nucleus. Okay, so transport control is another way that you can exert epigenetic control over which uh, genes are actually going to be expressed. So here's another uh, point where we can exert epigenetic control. Okay, uh, then Again, there are means by which you can control which mature mRNAs that have made it into the cytoplasm are actually going to be translated. So there is translational control as well. Okay, uh, So you can control whether the ribosome will actually assemble on a mature piece of mRNA and actually translate that into protein. Okay, finally, there are also uh, ways of degrading mature mRNAs uh, when they're in the cytoplasm. Okay, so degradation control. And in addition, uh, you can also control um, the protein level itself by controlling the protein uh, degradation. So RNA degradation is one form, okay, but a way that you can also control the protein, which is important, is protein degradation. You can control how quickly the protein that you actually produce is going to be degraded. And that's also a way of controlling which genes are actually expressed. If you're producing the protein at a high rate but destroying it at a high rate, then you might have a low expression of that protein overall in the cell. Okay, so all of these six different ways are ways that you can control uh, the transcriptome and the proteome within your cell, and therefore means by which you can exert epigenetic control within a cell. Okay, right. So, in the next video, what we will do is we will study transcriptional control in much more detail, and this will lead us on to uh, the topic of transcription regulators, which is going to hold the key as to how cells control um, what sort of a cell they are going to specialize as. So what actually maintains a neuron as a neuron and a hepatocyte as a hepatocyte? What controls the epigenetics within those cells and maintains uh, the transcriptome and proteome as roughly the same and therefore maintains that cell as the same cell type? That's what we're going to uh, look at. And the answer to that lies in transcriptional control rather than these in these other forms of control. So we're going to zoom in on transcriptional control, which it is fair to say is the most important means of epigenetic control.